Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of On the Mic with Mike. That's been a little while since we've last chatted, chatted and you know, we're in the midst of the pandemic. We're all doing our personal protection and such. So today we're gonna do an On the Mic with Mike just a little differently. We'll be doing it by video. Uh, but today we're also gonna be talking with Professor Timothy Caulfield. Now, many of you will know Tim's work uh, and particularly as he's looked to take on this, the questions of real science versus debunking science and such. The prolific writer in this area and a, a terrific person. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. I'll take my coffee, head up to the office, and why don't you join me there in a few minutes. So I'm really excited today to welcome uh, Professor Timothy Caulfield on On the Mic with Mike. As, as many of you might know, uh, but Tim is a, a professor and a Canada Research Chair in Health Law and Policy, a uh, professor in the Faculty of Law in the School of Public Health, and a Research Director at the Health Law Institute at the University of Alberta. Uh, so Tim, welcome to On the Mic with Mike. As you know, a little bit of this is all about uh, getting to know you, explain how you got to places, but you also have a really fascinating background in what you're doing. So welcome, welcome to us. Uh, thanks for having me on. So why don't we just jump right in uh, at this point, because uh, many people will know you. You've been the author of two national bestsellers, an award-winning uh, TV documentary show called A User's Guide to Cheating Death. So you've become really quite recognizable, but never more so than over the past year, right? Um, so you've always been known as one of these individuals who's really been at the forefront of battling scientific nonsense or bunk, right, for it. Uh, and you've been everywhere lately, all over the Canadian uh, news, talking about misinformation related to the COVID-19. Well, it, it hasn't have been an extraordinary year. Uh, I, I've been studying, you know, various forms of misinformation and how science has been represented for decades. And I've never seen anything like this. Uh, and oh. so we have been studying misinformation in the context of, of COVID thanks to the CIHR and, and a grant I've, I've, uh, I've received with, with my fantastic interdisciplinary team. Um, and it really has been extraordinary. Uh, so there is you know, misinformation about absolutely everything to do with the pandemic, of course, about the source of the pandemic, uh, about various cures, uh, and that's something that we're very, very interested in. Um, uh, also, you know, lots of misinformation about uh, you know, about the government's interventions, the government's role, which also can be incredibly problematic because it has an impact on, on trust. Uh, and of course, now we're seeing misinformation uh, about the vaccines and holy cow, that's having a measurable, tangible impact. We're talking about saving lives here. So, so, when, you say, so when you say misinformation, what is it that you mean? How, how yeah, are you using that word? Yeah. Hey, that, that's a great, that's a great question. You know, now I use misinformation as the umbrella term to really capture uh, um, all of the in, inaccurate information that's being disseminated, mostly on social media, but not just social media. Um, but you can break it down, right? You can break it down. There's disinformation and disinformation is often categorized as that inaccurate information uh, that is being spread with intention, right? There, there are individuals or entities that have a particular agenda and they're spreading the misinformation in order to forward that, that agenda. Uh, then there, is, there may be individuals that are just trying to do what's best for themselves, trying to do what's best for their family. They're curious and, and they're spreading inaccurate information on social media. And, and in fact, that's, that's probably the biggest source of, of misinformation. So there's various kinds of misinformation out there. Of course, there's individuals that are also selling products you know, that they, you know, they're immune boosting bunk. <laughs> they're trying to right. exploit the situation. Uh, so th you know, there's all these different kinds of categories of, of inaccurate information out there. But I like to put it all under the umbrella of misinformation uh, so that so we can kind of capture all of it. Because to be honest with you, yes, it, it, it it's helpful to get a sense of the different kinds of misinformation, but all of it does harm. So is there a so it's interesting as you phrase it in that manner, right? Um, and, and I'm going I'm to phrase this, and it probably is wrong, but nonetheless, you know, is there a malicious intent side to misinformation for personal gain, and 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 then is there just the simply, I haven't really understood that, and I've I've substituted knowledge that I have in play, and so that information, well, damaging and can be problematic, doesn't hold the same sort of 
nefariousness as maybe the first one. Is that a, a way of thinking about this? Yeah, I, I think that's a fair categorization if you're going to kind of lump them in, in tr into two right. broad categories. You know, I, I think that that is fair. And the first one, the first one, I don't even think it necessarily has to be malicious. You know, I, I think it might even be just they're trying to profit or, or they have a particular um, a, agenda or something that they could be gained from, from spreading the misinformation. So so there there are some that are have a malicious intent. They might be trying to use the pandemic to forward a particular ideological position or, or even to generate hate against a particular group. And we've seen that, unfortunately. Right. Um, but but in addition to that, there are individuals, you know, I'm thinking of the wellness influencers out there, the celebrity influencers, they're just trying to exploit this situation to sell product, right? Which is also, you know, infuriating, right? So it may, may not be malicious in, in their heart, <laughs> but it feels yeah. malicious to me. And then you have the other category. And you're right. You know, there's so much, I always call it, I call it the chaotic information environment. You know, I think that that, you get these individuals, many people, and we know it's a large percentage of Canadians. They're just trying. They're just struggling to find out what's real and what's not real. Really interesting study from StatCan came out uh, early 2021. 20, uh, found that 96 percent of Canadians admit that they see uh, misinformation, right? And it's you know it's really a hundred percent. But <laughs> but, right, but, right. but 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 the mere fact that 96 percent of Canadians recognize that is incredibly telling. So is that. So you know, as you're as you're talking, and you know, having um, you know, having looked into some of these areas before to think about them, is there, you know, is there a sense that there is a form of misinformation that goes back to the beginning of time, right? There's always, always going to be that, but is this form that we're talking about now, where it's really, you know, it's an informed environment that we live in. You can get information anywhere you want to get it from, and how you synthesize that and put that into your own belief systems allows you to have this sort of misinformation that, that can be problematic for help. But that wouldn't necessarily have been there 30, 40 years ago, maybe even 20 years ago, before we got into the social. So is it is one more, you know, um, a, a longer has been with us all these years? And is what we're seeing now something new and different? Uh, I, I think I think you're right on both counts. <laughs> so, okay. right? so misinformation is, has always been been with us. but I do think that we're, what we're seeing today is different, both qualitatively and quantitatively. So uh, it's different qualitatively because we're starting to see misinformation increasingly be attached to, for example, ideology, right? Um, and it can be weaponized for a particular ideological thing. Of course, you can think about it in the political context, but you can also think of it in the health context because we're seeing it with we're seeing it with vaccines, right? Where 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 misinformation around things like choice and freedom and liberty, those kinds of intuitively appealing ideas, are being used uh, as a way, uh, almost a Trojan horse, uh, to get across misinformation. You know, when you're focused on this ideology that perhaps resonates with with you, you it it allows those who are pushing the misinformation to sidestep the science. So we're definitely seeing that. Uh, but I also think it that from a quantitative perspective. You probably can guess where I'm going with this. Social media, it yeah. has transformed it. You know, I, there, yes, misinformation is coming from other sources, right? It's coming from friends, you know, and it is in the conventional uh, news media, not as bad as it has been in the past. I think actually conventional news has done a pretty good job here. But this is largely, not entirely, but largely a social media uh, phenomenon. And, and there's been studies that have highlighted that, right? Mm -hmm. We've looked at this from different directions. This is largely a social media phenomenon. And we know that people who get their their information from social media, from Facebook, from Twitter, from Instagram, more likely to be misinformed, more likely to believe misinformation. Now, yes, we have to be careful about that kind of data, correlation, causation, but I think we've come at it from enough directions, from a methodological perspective, that we have a body of evidence that says that's true, and, and it's not gonna surprise anyone. <laughs> it also feels intuitively correct. So, so it's interesting, so let's take that a little bit further then, right, because, you know, I think, one of the things that we've done, I think, really well in Canada is we've made fairly clear that our decisions that we're making with regards to the options that are available to us are driven by evidence, are driven by science. And so you hear that coming from multiple different levels. And we know from the literature as well, right, that the physician scientists still hold a pretty high level uh, within the, the overall community of respect of opinion uh, with that uh, going forward. But is there a risk that, as we say more and more, 
we are going to make evidence-based decisions driven by science that the voices out there that say, but the science isn't good, or we don't believe the science, can overwhelm that. Is there a risk of that? I, 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 that's a really fascinating question. Uh, I don't know if there's a risk of that. So uh, okay. uh, let me and let me let me answer back that a little bit, because because I, I I think that one of the reasons you, that might be driving that question is the fact that we have now a public that is watching science unfold, you know, and, and I think the entire population, almost almost the entire population, is watching, and that doesn't always happen. You know, we don't don't right. always have this intense scrutiny of how science is done. And so I think what, what's happening is, you know, I always like to say that, you know, the public's watching the sausage being made and they don't like what they're seeing. So they're seeing retractions, right? They, they're, they're seeing scientists disagree with each other. Um, they're seeing this slow and iterative process of mm -hmm. the accumulation of a body of evidence around masks, for example. And, and I think when you're watching that play out, it can look ugly, it can look messy, but you know, and I know, that's how science happens. That's, like, that's science, that's right? That is that is science. So I, I think that it, it, that this, this should remind us of a couple of things. Number one, it's a reminder of how important it, it is to do science well, right? You know, because it's so easy to lose public trust. And when the public is watching, they're seeing the faults, they're seeing the, the missteps. It's important to make sure that science is done well in a way that is trustworthy, right? So that, that's number one. Number two, I think it also highlights how important it is to, to communicate science well. And I, I was lucky to co-author uh, a, a report for the Royal Society, Society of Canada on exactly this. You know, how, how should we communicate science? And I think it's really important. We, what, one of the things we've learned is we need to do it well. Because if you're too dogmatic about something and then the science changes, you're going to lose public trust. And we saw that again. The mask debate is a good example of it, right? Um, hydroxychloroquine, another good example mm -hmm. of it, right? Uh, you know, I, I think it's really important to communicate not only the conclusions of science, but a little bit about the process and a little bit about the uncertainty and how science does evolve. Uh, and, and lastly, I'll say, uh, I think it really speaks to the importance of, of educating the public about the scientific process. We have to tell stories not just about, um, you know, CIHR is, is getting better and better at this, I think, not just about... Um, not just about the conclusions, but about the process, about the people that do the work, about the individuals that are invested in this, because I think that brings the, the public along uh, on the ride. And it's a fascinating ride. And, and if, if they're with us on the journey, I think it gives us a lot more room to tell them about where the science is going. Terrific. So, so that's a beautiful segue into asking, what's science up first? So, so science up first, hashtag science up first. It is, it is a national movement. And, and to be honest with you, we hope it becomes an international movement to really, at its core, the goal is to spread credible information on social media. As I said before, we know that social media is, is one of the primary sources of misinformation. It's been the, you know, driven all the polarization, it's driven uh, the, the conspiracy theories. So we want to flood social media with credible content right. uh, and, and, and content that responds to the public that, you know, allows us to really listen to what the public is concerned about and give them credible, shareable. And by that, I mean, you know, stuff that works well on Twitter, okay. on Facebook, on Instagram. Uh, and it really is. We want to create like an army, <laughs> an army of so tens of thousands of people that are sharing this 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 information. Uh, so, and the other thing we, we're doing is we wanted to make it really simple to become part of the team. So all you need to do is follow uh, on, uh, you know, Science Up First uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, and we're going to be on TikTok also, um, and share that, share that content. And you can also become part of the team by actually becoming, if you're a scientist, becoming uh, one of the individuals that helps us vet the content. So we're, we're, creating, we're creating new content and we're sharing the credible stuff that is is already out there. And it's been tremendously successful out of the gate. I, you know, I think in the first two or three weeks, we had 50 million impressions. Uh, we're getting oh, thousands wow. of people sharing content. So okay. um, yeah, we really, and we hope to, we hope that, that this is something that survives the pandemic, that it really becomes kind of a movement and something that, that you know, if you're a grade six uh, student who's interested in science, you can become part of it. And if you're someone who's sequencing the genome of the woolly mammoth, you can become you can become part of this movement. We want to make it something that everyone's proud to be part of, and and will live on past the pandemic. 
So how does that, so you, you talked about, um, you know, reviewing and looking at uh, some of this material then. So, you know, for our colleagues who are out in the field are going to be saying, hey, you know, this is pretty cool. I wouldn't mind being part of this uh, first. Uh, so let's assume that's somebody like me. You know, I do well to turn on the computer every day and, and then get my confocals up. That's about it. So how much of a time commitment is this going to be for a scientist to say, I want to be part of this and to bring uh, some of these information and discussions forward? Well, well, the good news is I think more and more scientists are becoming part of this conversation. They're recognizing how valuable science communication is. And I think that's an interesting shift we could talk about too, right? You know, I, when I first started working in this area, this kind of science communication you know, it was viewed as important, but kind of fringy, right? But now it's, even in grants, research grants, you know, they want to know what your KT is. They want to know how you're going to engage the public. So that's an awesome shift. The reason I bring that up is, you know, there are more and more scientists and clinicians out there that are interested in this and are devoting time on social media to doing this. And, and they're enjoying it because it is a great, it is a great community. But, but you can devote as much time or as little time as you want. And that's, and we really wanted to make science at first nimble like that. So if you just want to get on social media and share the content, that's all you need to do. I mean, that almost takes no time at all. Also, maybe you're not on social media so much, but you have patients, you know, that you, you engage with. There's going to be content there that will hopefully be helpful to you and helpful to your, your patients or even maybe even, the, you know, your community uh, more broadly. So um, you can get engaged in a variety of different ways. And you can dive in all the way and become a science communicator yourself. And maybe right. you're creating content, you know, you're creating your own videos and that might be something that we're going to want to share on, on science at first. It, Cause that's the other thing I think is really important to highlight. We want to partner with people, right? We really want to make this, you know, not a centralized thing. We want to make this something that really has a life of its own. So how will you, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of putting myself in your classroom right now, right? I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm listening to you and I'm going, great. Uh, I get it. I actually get it. But you've taught me about metrics and you've taught me about measurable. I'm, I'm kind of you know, playing the role here a little bit on that. So, so how will you know when you're into this, other than you know, the number of hits and everything I get, but uh, we talk about scaling up and we talk about impact on health outcomes, right? And particularly in the midst of a pandemic when, as you know, it's evolving so rapidly. How will you know that you're on the right track? Well, you know, I, I think that one of the great things about social media is that you have these huge ends, right? You know, we actually do social me media research. And and so uh, you get a lot of metrics. You know? <laughs> it's really nice. And so one of the ways that we can study the impact that we're having is to see who, uh, you know, we do those kind of a network analysis, right? And we can see who's listening, you know, where is our, our message spreading? And you can kind of even map it. Now, with something like, like the spread of misinformation, and you can see science at first in the in this node, and and even if it shifts a little bit, it, that matters, right? Because that means we're we're talking to new people, and and what with with something like uh, the spread of misinformation, even a little bit of movement matters. Right? We're talking about moving the needle here, right? And the other thing that is really important, and so I'm glad you brought this up, is uh, another crucial element to science at first is we want to make our communication strategies science based. So we're really trying to look at what does the evidence say about how we should communicate? And this is some of the work that we're even doing at, at our institute. What, what works? And we want to base our communication strategies on that. And the good news is there's a growing body of evidence that, you know, debunking, not a great term. I, I, I think it's become the term of art, but <laughs> let's use it. Debunking does work, okay? It does work. It may not feel like it works, but it does, uh, especially if you look at it on a population level. And that's the way I think we need to think of something like science up first. It's a population-based initiative. We may not change, you know, the mi the mind of that crazy uncle that you have that sent you the, right. the post on Facebook, but in the aggregate and over time, it, we hope it'll have an impact. And okay. I always like to say, uh, look, it may not feel like debunking uh, works, but imagine a world where people didn't try to do this, like where there was incredible information on social media, it would be even worse. Fascinating. So let me move to a slightly different topic right now, right? And I think, you know, we all see this for sure, um, is the the level of anxiety that has come to exist uh, in, in the population. I see it amongst my friends. I, I think we all feel it at some point. You get up in the morning and you hear about an emerging variant. And before the day's done, you've heard a second emerging variant. And it's kind of like, I don't want to wake up tomorrow. Like, I just, I've had it. This thing is not a sentient being, but my God, it's driving us nuts. Um, and we'll be on top of it. That's not my worry. But 
even for those of us who are living this and going through it every day and, and have the sign, anxiety, those pressures are there. I talk to my colleagues, I talk to family members, and it's, it's magnitudes greater for that. So you've recently written on this and, and started to focus a bit around how the age of this anxiety. Talk to us a little bit about that. How did you get into that to begin with? And I think I can understand how we got there in this context, but where do you want it to go? Well, uh, you're right. I am fascinated by this. And, and um, I, I, I think I've used this phrase already. It's this chaotic information environment. And there really is interesting research emerging about the impact that it has uh, on how we interpret the information that we're getting, you know, interpret the content that we're seeing on social media, the impact it's having on our mental health, increasing anxiety, uh, and also on our sharing behavior, right? So there is this fascinating research that shows that the, there's this horrible cycle that's forming. So, so you know, getting your news from social media, being constantly bombarded from about all this information about the pandemic, but you know, we can talk about other health topics too, but about the pandemic does increase our anxiety, increase our stress levels, that in turn may have an impact on our ability to critically assess the information that we're seeing in the chaotic information environment. And there's a little bit of evidence to suggest that it might increase our, our uh, sharing behavior. So you, you can see this horrible cycle. So then we share, we feed the machine, <laughs> that creates more anxiety, and around and around it goes. So any intervention that we are going to introduce needs to try to break that cycle, right? Try to get people to, to reflect. And so, you know, my new book, you know, uh, I, I try to invite people to do that. And, and I talk about what the evidence says around that, uh, but also to highlight all those cognitive biases that we have that play to this. So we do have, there is a negativity bias. You know, we, we are hardwired, you know, that's not a great uh, term because it is so much more complex than that. But, but we do seem to have a, an evolutionary predisposition to respond to negative news. No surprise, right? You, get, you mm -hmm. should remember the bad stuff. Um, but that plays out terribly now. For example, there's really interesting research that suggests that, that, that negative headlines outperform positive headlines, right? So that takes place in the context of the news, but it all ta also takes place in the context of our head. Right. Uh, so we have that kind of bias. And we have like the, also the availability bias. We remember dramatic things. So that's one of the reasons that these anecdotes um, and testimonials will often outperform data so you remember the story about the person that had an adverse reaction to the to the covid vaccine but you ignore the the research from the cdc that has looked at millions millions of of moments uh, you know data points at, but the anecdote wins out right so reminding ourselves of those of those cognitive biases and lastly i could go on and on but the last one i'll point to is is we also, it also reminds us that teaching critical thinking, right, uh, has an impact and inviting people to pause, to pause, to relax, to reflect. And my, my colleague, Gordon Pennycook at the University of Regina, who also receives funding from the CIHR as part of our research team, he's done research that's found that that simple nudge, that simple nudge, inviting people to pause, inviting people to reflect, can decrease the spread of misinformation. And I know it sounds ridiculously simple, but there's actually evidence to back that up. And actually his work has been replicated by other laboratories. So that's a really good example of an evidence-based intervention, uh, just asking people to reflect, to relax, to pause, that can have an impact on the spread of misinformation. Terrific, that's, thanks for that. You know, it's, in, in listening to you, you know, it's, um, you know, it's clear the passion that you've got behind all of this. That, I mean, that's, that's, that's very clear for it. You know, and one of the things that we put this together, the whole on the mic, the mic was, you know, there's, there's a whole generation behind us that's thinking about science, right? And I think what I'm certainly hearing is thinking about it more now, right? I, I worry that we're going to have a crush of new virologists coming, but nonetheless, <laughs> um, it's, it's about science. Um, and, and this passion that you've got, um, where did it come from? Uh, you know, I, I get asked that off, often. You know, I, I think I've always been a science geek. I've always been obsessed with uh, with what the evidence says behind a particular belief, even when I was a kid, you know, and, and I was still believing in some of the more pseudoscientific things, you know, I've always been interested in, you know, what does the evidence ac actually say? And then when I became uh, an academic um, in the early 90s, uh, right out of the gate, um, you know, I, I kind of thought I was going to be more of a traditional law professor. And right out of the gate, I had these 
terrific mentors. How important are mentors, right? Yes, How right. important are more yes. mentors? You know, Bartha Maria Canoppers, uh, uh, Justice Ellen Bacard, um, and uh, Gerald Robertson. Uh, these were people that you know opened up my eyes to the 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 reality that you can be any kind of academic you really want. You know, Bartha is great at this. You know, she was a pioneer in the idea that you can have these big interdisciplinary teams. And so I, I'm really, really fortunate that I had, and you know, Ellen's the same, right? You know, a law professor can do all these things. Um, so I was really lucky out of the gate to have mentors that said, you know, do something that you're passionate about. The, and, and so I was able to work with, you know, because I often don't have the methodological skills to, to do a lot of the stuff I'm interested in. So you know what you do? You partner with someone, you, you find a friend, another colleague who's doing it, uh, has those skills and you work together. And, that, and first of all, that's tremendously fun. It's really exciting to have these great colleagues, but then you bring together all these different disciplines. And I've been, one, I've been so lucky to be on these, these great teams that have done exactly that. And, and as I said, right out of the gate, I mean, my first, <laughs> and I actually think I was a little surprised when I first started wor working with Bartha. I was like, what, I, I, I can, this is my, what my career can look like. <laughs> Right. And so I'm so grateful that I've had these these wonderful minds in my life that have kind of led the way. So, it's, you know, it's interesting you say that. Your career could have gone differently, right? Um, you know, I read somewhere that you were actually in a punk rock band. Is that right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I was, you know, if, if you had asked me, you know, let's say I'm 20 years old or even the age of some of my, my kids right now. And you asked me, what are you going to do? I'm going to be a rock star. That's what I'm going to do. Not a good career choice. And I, I was I was down that path quite deep, actually. It wasn't like it was you know, something I was just doing in my basement. I was, I um, you know, I opened for the Ramones. You know, I, I've had, uh, you know, al albums. I can see one of my my vinyl albums from here. Uh, okay. So, yeah, so it was, you know, we were, we were uh, traveling around uh, Canada. Um, but my mom played a trick on me. Uh, she was, you know, uh, rest in peace. She was very, very clever. She's, you know, I'll support whatever you want to do, Timothy. You know, I support you. Uh, but promise me you'll get a university degree. That was her thing. You know, okay. you just have to get a university degree. You can do whatever you want. Just yep. get it. And I think she knew that once I got into it deeper and deeper and deeper, the passion would be there. And, and, the, and I would realize that this path made a lot more sense than than the rock and roll path. It's not an easy way to make a living, by the way, being a rock star. I, I think being an artist of any sort right now. Yeah, it's very, very hard. Uh, as well, then. Well, listen, before we go, you know, there's always a question that I like to ask towards the end of these uh, interviews. And that is, if you could sit down and have a conversation with anybody you wanted from any time period, who would it be? Oh, my gosh. Um, I'd love to talk to uh, Dwayne. Uh, the Rock Johnson, but I'm not going to say that. <laughs> yeah, I'll be joining you for that one. <laughs> he, he just seems like a really, a really fun guy. This it's a cliche. It's a cliche. Is that okay? Is it yes. Okay? Darwin. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. uh, and I, I think Lincoln. Uh, there's so many. Lincoln yes. would be would be fascinated. Uh, Curry. Oh my gosh. I. Where do you stop? Where do you yes. stop? So maybe I'll land on the Rock. <laughs> so. You know what? Terrific place to land. Absolutely. Listen, Tim, this has been wonderful. And I have to say, first off, thank you for what you're doing, right? I think all of us as scientists, as clinician scientists or practitioners, you know, this, this constant um, having to make sure that people understand what the real evidence is, is increasingly a, a bigger part of our time. Knowing that there are people out there also saying to the whole of the community that you need to listen to science um, and here's what's happening. I think it's a tremendous help to all of us. So on behalf of the whole community, I just want to say thank you. I look forward to when we can have a chat, um, perhaps not over a screen. Uh, and uh, I wish you nothing but continued success. So thank you so, so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Oh, Cheers. You're welcome. Cheers. <laughs> so that's it. That's another one of our episodes of On the Mic with Mike. Uh, today, we've been joined by Professor Tim Caulfield. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you again. In the meantime, take care, use your personal protection, and uh, we'll see you again very, very soon. So have a good one.